today we have Dr. Kroll joining us um, and he's going to talk about the psychology of religion and he's a psychology professor at NKU. Um, so he's going to share his experience and his presentation with us and as he's talking you can put some questions in the chat and I'll make sure he uh, sees them and gets them answered. And then next week, um, April 21st, we have a Meet the Experts about radiation therapy. And um, we're gonna have Dr. Lastly uh, come and join us and she is the radiation therapy program director at NKU. So definitely sign up for that. That'll be interesting as well. Um, so yeah, if Dr. Cole, you wanna go ahead and take it away. <laughs> okay, very good, very good. Uh, okay, so I just hope to uh, talk a little bit about the field of the psychology of religion, and then I'll tell you about a couple of studies uh, that I did. And then, uh, thanks to two of my kids who are in high school, I have a Kahoot, which I understand you all are familiar with. You probably know a lot more about it than I do. But I just started using it not that long ago, and I thought, wow, this is really fun. So anyway, I'm thinking of using it in classes as well. Anyway, so here we go. And if anyone has any questions, feel free to, you know, raise your hand virtually or, uh, you know, however you want to, if you want to do the hand icon or anything like that, let me know. Uh, sorry, I just got out of the shower. I've been running, and so I'm still kind of like recovering from that. <laughs> okay, so uh, uh, let me mention just some things about what the psychology of religion is. Uh, I think most people, at least this is my experience at NKU, when they hear the term psychology of religion, they probably think of something like world religions. They think, oh, well, we're going to spend some time talking about Christianity and Judaism and Islam and Buddhism and Hinduism and so on and so forth. But really, it's not like that. It's, uh, it's really more the uh, study of people with regard to their faith. So since it's the psychology of religion, it isn't really a religion class. It's more like studies of people with regard to things that have to do with faith. Let me give you some examples. And so they might have questions like this one. How can we measure religiosity? That's a big question. There's a whole bunch of different scales that have been developed and people think, you know, I think I'm it should be measured like this. Other people say that. Other people say this. And really, there's not one settled uh, best way, I guess you could say, to measure, which might seem like a disadvantage at first. But really, in a sense, it's sort of a good thing, because what happens is we get a much uh, richer picture because one person says, well, I'm going to do it this way, and they do a study. And someone else says, well, I think it ought to be done like this. And somebody else says, I think I'm going to do it this way. And so we end up with a whole bunch of different pictures to look at. Uh, but let me give you some more topics. So people might ask, is there a relationship between biology and religiosity? People might ask, is religiosity associated with cognitive style, like a, a particular way of thinking? I hope to get into that in one of the studies that I hope to cover. Uh, how does religiosity change from childhood to adulthood? So uh, if you uh, have... Uh, perhaps in a class covered Piaget's model of cognitive development, you might recall that he maintains that thinking moves from concrete to abstract. And people have found the same kind of thing with regard to religiosity. Kids tend to have a pretty concrete view of uh, religious things and might have a difficult time picturing things that are not material and that kind of thing. But then as they move toward adulthood, then their thinking becomes more sophisticated with regard to religion just as it does in general. What's the relationship between religiosity and personality? You might be familiar with this <clears throat> common way of measuring personality called the big five. And so people have looked, you know, do religious people tend to be high on certain of these big five factors or lower on certain other ones, things like that. Does religiosity play a role in psychological health? So people might look at, you know, rates of depression or anxiety or things like that. Are religious people higher in this? Are they lower? <clears throat> that kind of thing. <clears throat> Sorry. Uh, in general, it's been found that religious people tend to be physically healthier. They tend to live longer and have fewer health problems. And so now, really, I think there's much more of a focus not on uh, whether that's true, but why. Like, what is it? 
uh, that causes that to be true. And as you might guess, a, an obvious one is uh, certain health decisions, like maybe they don't drink or they don't smoke or things like that. And that, so that's probably part of the story, but it doesn't, it's probably not the whole thing. There's probably other factors as well, like maybe a person's religious view helps people to cope with stress. You might know that stress can cause physical illness by suppression, suppressing your immune system. And, you know, so maybe factors like that as well. Uh, how do religious people treat those with whom they disagree? That's a, in my field of social psych, that's something that people talk about a lot. It's like, in general, people tend to react more favorably toward members of their own group, whatever that group might be, than members of the out group. And so people have looked at the same kind of thing with regard to religious groups. How do people treat members of their own religious group versus members of other groups? Things like that. Uh, are religious people more helpful? And there's uh, some degree of controversy because it seems to depend upon how you measure helpfulness. And so sometimes yes, sometimes no. So anyway, and then does religiosity help people cope with tragic or stressful events? I hope to cover one study at least that has to do with that. But there's lots and lots of work, hundreds and hundreds, maybe thousands of studies on all kinds of different things. I teach a whole semester class on psychoreligion. Anyway, so. Uh, so let me get into the first of the two topics that I hope to cover at least a little bit about. And so this is the, my working title, I guess you could say, for this work, uh, having to do with religiosity and analytical reasoning. So let me elaborate a little bit about what I mean. So there's been a lot of uh, interest in probably the last 20 years in the cognitive science of religion. That is, how do people think with regard to things about religiosity? And it's been suggested by several people in this area that they say, well, maybe the reason or one reason why religion seems to be so widespread in almost every culture, you find a lot of religious people, uh, maybe that's because the human mind has characteristics that fit well with religious belief. In other words, the way human beings tend to think tends to incline them or predispose them toward being religious, something like that. And another way of putting that would be maybe religious thinking is just kind of natural, that people just sort of tend to default toward a religious view and people who are non-religious have changed from that natural one, so natural and intuitive, and that intuitive part is going to become a big deal because that's really where the, <laughs> when people are measuring things, that's one of the two things that they're looking for is an intuitive style versus a more analytical style. And so if this is the case that religious thinking tends to be more natural and intuitive, then the idea would be that, well, maybe religious people tend to rely on their intuition more. And that's part of the reason why they tend to be religious is that they're intuitive in their way of thinking and that people who are not religious tend to be not as intuitive. And the other style that they contrast with intuitive thinking is analytical thinking, where people might not go with their intuition, but may sort of analyze things more. Okay. so. How could one go about testing that? And of course, there's multiple ways that you could test that. But let me tell you a little bit about how they've gone about doing that. And so a common way is to use this thing. There's other scales, but this is probably the most common one. The cognitive reflection test, or CRT. It's a common way to contrast an intuitive way of thinking versus an analytical way of thinking. And it only has three questions, so it's really easy to describe. Let me give you the questions. And so uh, for each of these three questions, there's an immediate intuitive answer. In this case, the intuitive answers happen to all be wrong. Sometimes intuitive answers could be correct, of course. It's not like all intuitive answers are wrong and analytical answers are right. But in this particular case, the intuitive answers are wrong. And so the question is, will people seize upon the immediate intuitive answer or will they tend to go, well, wait a minute, maybe not, and tend to miss them? Let me give you those three. And so one of them is this. 
A bat and a ball cost a dollar ten in total. The bat costs a dollar more than the ball. How much does the ball cost? Anyone want to venture a guess? Okay, well, I'll tell you, as you might be able to guess, the intuitive answer that people tend to immediately go, oh, bat and the ball cost a dollar ten, the bat costs a dollar more than the ball, the ball is ten cents. But if you stop and think about it for a second, it's like, well, wait a minute, if the bat costs a dollar and the ball costs 10 cents, then the ball is only 90 cents less. And so you have to stop for a minute and go, well, wait a minute. Okay, I guess the ball has to cost a nickel and the bat costs a dollar five, then they're a dollar apart. Or what about this one? It takes five machines, five minutes to make five widgets. How long would it take 100 machines to make 100 widgets? And once again, the intuitive answer would be 100. It's like five machines, five minutes to make five, 100 machines, 100 minutes to make 100. But if you stop and think about it, it's like, well, wait a minute. It's just kind of, <laughs> it's, it's a trick, basically, that it's set up with all three of those fives. If you stop and look at it for a second, you can probably see, well, wait a minute. So five machines take five minutes to make five widgets. That means in five minutes, each machine makes one. <laughs> There's five machines and in a five minute period, they make five. So in a five minute period, each machine makes one. And so a hundred machines ought to be able to make a hundred in five minutes also. <laughs> and so you have to kind of stop and think about that last one. In a lake, there's a patch of lily pads. The patch doubles in size every day. If it takes 48 days for the patch to cover the entire lake, how many days would it take to cover half the lake? Once again, the intuitive answer is, well, half, I guess that would be 24. But if you stop and think about it a little more, it's like, well, wait a minute. It doubles every day. So it's getting much bigger each day. And if you stop and consider for a while, you might recognize that it will cover half of the lake in 47 days because in the last day when it doubles, then it will cover everything. And so once again, the idea is to contrast the immediate intuitive answer versus people going, well, wait a minute, <laughs> maybe not. Maybe it's something else. Let me stop and think this over. <laughs> maybe my initial intuition is incorrect. Okay, so people have used this test and others, but they've used this test to try to look and see if Religious people versus non-religious people tend to be different on their CRT score and consistent with the idea that religious thinking may be intuitive and natural. Some research, at least the majority right now, has generally found that religious people tend to score a little lower on the CRT than non-religious people do. Okay, so as some of you might be able to appreciate, I think from the standpoint of a religious person, that's like, well, that doesn't sound so good. That makes it sound like, you know, we're, we're not as good as an at answering those kinds of questions, that kind of thing. But I've got more to say on that. So anyway, this, this work, and there's a fair amount right now, suggests that the relationship between religiosity and the cognitive reflection task looks something like this, that if you got higher scores on the vertical axis here, then as you move from less religious to more religious, scores tend to go down, which is in general what people have found. But I personally think that that's not actually how it works. And so let me describe my argument for why I think it's not that way. And so the researchers have primarily so far have focused a lot on the non-religious end of the scale. And so they focused a lot on like, how do atheists differ from people who are religious on the CRT? And in general, what they found is that atheists score higher than religious people do on the CRT. But they haven't looked very much at a continuum of religiosity. You know, you could have some people who are kind of maybe a little bit religious, and they're religious compared to atheists. But then you could have people who are a lot more religious. And so it could be that the relationship is what I think. Uh, 
is actually a curvilinear relationship. In other words, it's not a straight line, it's a curve, such that it could be that less religious people like atheists, although some would argue that atheism is a religion as well, so that's debatable, but anyway. So less religious people tend to be high, and then as people become more religious, their CRT scores tend to go down. In other words, they tend to focus on more intuitive answers. But then as people become more religious, then scores might go up again. And I put in as an illustration of how this might be, uh, it could be like the relationship between religiosity and belief in the paranormal. So like belief in ghosts and you know, crystal balls astrology and you know, ESP, things like that. And uh, some work suggested that over-religious people are uh, higher in paranormal beliefs than like atheists are. But as people began to get, look at it in a more sophisticated way, they found that the relationship is actually curvilinear, that it, in this case, it's an inverted U. And so instead of a U like, a U like this, it's the other way around, that atheists tend to be low in paranormal beliefs then as religiosity increases, paranormal beliefs tend to go up. And then as religiosity increases more, they tend to go back down. Mm -hmm. So atheists and people who are very religious tend to be low in their belief in the paranormal and people who are moderate in their religiosity tend to be higher. So I thought it could be something like that, except in reverse. So, so I did a study where I recruited uh, people, actually two studies, but I'll just combine them in this case. And uh, they completed, and I had people who were NKU students. I had members of the Church of Christ. That's my, like, I wanted to get a group of highly religious people. And then uh, some people from this thing called MTurk. Uh, some of you might be familiar with this, but if not, it's this thing called Mechanical Turk. It's uh, something done by Amazon. Basically, it's a meeting place for researchers can post stuff and then people can fill out the surveys and they get paid a small amount to fill them out. And so uh, I've got like a college sample, I have like a church sample, and then I've got kind of a people in general sample, you might say. And so they're kind of all combined in this. And so what did I find about the relationship overall with across all these people about religiosity and uh, the CRT score, and as is often the case, it's not perfect. <laughs> it doesn't look exactly like the U thing that I was hoping for, but you can see it's sort of a little bit like that, that the less religious people seem to be maybe a little bit higher, and the thing that for me was more interesting was if you take a look at the more religious one, very clearly the more religious people are not low, <laughs> that their scores tend to go up. And uh, uh, as I mentioned, there's controversy about how religiosity ought to be measured. And so uh, uh, a colleague and I have been working on a knowledge scale uh, where we measure people's Bible knowledge. I realize, of course, that Bible knowledge would not be uh, a good way to measure religiosity for people who are like, you know, Hindus or Buddhists or something like that, but for an American population, it could work pretty well. And when you look at that, it looks something like this. And so as you can see, as their Bible knowledge, that's the one on the bottom there, as their Bible knowledge score goes up, then toward the high end of Bible knowledge, CRT scores also go up. So that seems to suggest that, well, a lot of work has found that uh, People who are very non-religious, atheists in particular, tend to be high on the CRT compared to religious people. But as you get more religious, then scores tend to go up. And so it's probably not a line. It's probably more like a, something like this. OK, so I spent a lot more time on that one than I'm going to spend on this one. but. That's, that's the end of my first area that I wanted to cover. Does anyone have any questions on that before I go on? I'm not seeing any questions in the chat, but people are free to unmute themselves or type some in. Yeah, if, like if you want to say something, please feel free. They tell us in like teacher training that you're supposed to wait 10 seconds. 10 seconds of silence actually feels like a really long time. So one, two, three. 
three because we're so used to short pauses in conversation. It's like, are there any questions? No? Okay, well, I'll move along. You know, we hardly tend to give people a chance. Anyway, so I'll go ahead, but if you have questions later, please feel free. Okay, so here's another area of work having to do with coping with the death of a loved one, which is a tragic thing that unfortunately, probably all of us are going to have to deal with at some time or another. And so let me give you some work on this. And so uh, when people lose someone close to them, an aging parent, uh, you know, a friend, a sibling, seems to be worst of all when people lose a child, as you might be able to guess, uh, but it tends to produce a variety of negative outcomes, depression, you know, poor health and things like that, because it really takes a toll on someone when something like that happens, understandably so. And people have found in general that people who are more religious tend to cope better with the death of a loved one. Uh, not that they necessarily cope well with it. <laughs> it's still difficult, I'm sure, for everybody, but they tend to cope better with it. Okay, so once again, that's, that's what's in general been found, but I'm often interested in, well, you know, that's what in general has been found, but could there be exceptions or things along those lines? And so I thought, well, uh, why is it that religious people cope better? Maybe the reason is that they think, well, uh, if they hold to a religious view where they believe in an afterlife, like heaven, then they might think, okay, well, I'm really sad about the fact that this person passed away. I'm really going to miss them. My life is really going to change. It's really going to be difficult. However, I have hope of being reunited with them later on. So it's not like our relationship is over. I hope to see them again. If that's true, if that's part of the reason why people tend to cope better when they're more religious, then what if they don't expect to meet the person later on? And so what if you have a situation like this? What if there's someone close to them uh, and the person passes away and they're thinking, well, that person's, you know, they didn't hold to, they were not faithful to God. They lived a life that was, you know, bad or whatever and things like that. And so I actually don't expect that I'm going to see them in heaven. And so in that case, we might expect that religious people would have a harder time <laughs> because for a non-religious person, they may think, well, you know, people die and that's the end. But for a religious person, they may be thinking, well, for sometimes when a person dies, I have hope of seeing them again. But for others, that's it. I'm never going to see them again. And so it may be even more difficult for a religious person when someone passes away and they think that person is not going to be in heaven. So I did a study where I had uh, some participants from Mechanical Turk, that's sort of a general sample of people, and uh, 36 members of the Church of Christ, that's my highly religious uh, sample to be able to compare. And I asked them a question about, have you ever had anyone close to you who shared your religious view who passed away? And have you ever had someone close to you who didn't share your religious view who passed away? And then I asked them about how easy or difficult that was. And so they were asked, you know, did the fact that the person shared or did not share your view make their passing easier or harder? And so what did I find in general? Here's what I found. So as you can see in the lighter kind of bluish, teal, whatever you call that, uh, colored bars. In general, people found it easier in both the M-Turk more general group and in the church group. They both found it easier uh, if the person shared their view than if the person did not share. But as you can see, for the church group, it made a much bigger difference. So for them, if the person shared their view, uh, they found that a lot easier to deal with. And so easier than the people in the more general group did, which fits with all the prior work that's been done about how religious people tend to cope somewhat better with uh, when a loved one passes away. But if it's somebody who didn't share their view, they actually said that was harder 
and even harder than the MTurk people said. And so that would seem to suggest that religious people might cope better sometimes, but not necessarily all the time. Okay, so lots more work, lots of different topics, lots of more studies to do. I'm running stuff right now. And so it's kind of an interesting area, I think. And in general, the, uh, I think psych of religion in the last, say, 25 years or so has really increased in popularity. It sort of has waxed and waned in the real early days of the field of psychology. There was a lot of interest in religion. Then there was sort of a period of time when psychologists were really very interested, it seemed like, and then it's been making a kind of a resurgence there. So I would call that good. Okay, so. And it looks like we did have a question come through in the chat. Yeah, sure. Um, they asked if you enjoy teaching this topic. Oh, yes. So yeah, this is one of my favorite uh, topics to cover. Uh, like I mentioned, I have a semester class that I teach on this, as you might guess, because it's not a core area, like, you know, cognition, biopsych development, social, something like that. I don't get to teach it very often because the department has requirements. We have to offer these classes and stuff. But every once in a while, I get to teach, and I really like having the chance to do that. How about that? There you go, yeah. And then we do have another question, if you want to answer oh, yeah, that before. Sure. Yeah, go ahead. It gets started. Um, they asked what your career path was like and what you majored in uh, in college. Oh, yeah, sure. Uh, so uh, when I started college, I thought I wanted to be a veterinarian. And I worked in vet hospitals and things like that. And I thought, this is what I want to do. And uh, then I started taking classes and I was like, taking things like biology and bacteriology and physiology and zoology and chemistry and things like that. And I wasn't doing very well in them and I wasn't really enjoying them very much. Admittedly, part of that was because uh, I was pretty immature. I think when I started college, and probably not really prepared to go at that point. Uh, but anyway, so I struggled with that for a while and eventually I ended up changing my major to psych. Um, which I found more interesting. And at least at that point, I guess probably this is true for most of us, I found it easier to work on things that I was more interested in. <laughs> and so um, I did that, but then I wasn't even sure what I wanted to do, uh, whether I wanted to go into that as a field or whether I wanted to do something else, I wasn't really sure. But I've always been kind of a nerdy person. And so I kind of liked school pretty well. I like the academic environment and walking around campus and that kind of thing. And uh, so I thought, okay, well, I'll apply to graduate school and see what happens. And uh, just word of advice, if you apply to graduate schools, apply to a lot, because even people whose records were much better than mine typically don't get in everywhere. But I applied to a bunch of places and I got into a couple of them. And so I thought, okay, well, I think I'm gonna do this. So I went to the university, oh, my undergrad was at the University of California at Davis, which is, I grew up in California. And uh, then I went to graduate school at the University of Texas in Austin for social psych, which is the area that I'm trained in. Then I went to Missouri, uh, University of Missouri for six years. And then I came to NKU in 1996. So yeah, yeah, it's been fun. <laughs> Okay, so yeah, good job, both of you. So yeah, it's not the study of religious views or things like that, study of people with regard to faith <clears throat> type topics. And then as you can probably see, there's the pin down there in the bottom 102414. It looks like they got in now, so yeah, should be good it. to go. <laughs> okay.
job. Way to go. Excellent. It's only batting a thousand here. Okay, so this may have been somewhat confusing because uh, I gave you what the field currently says, but then I gave you a different point of view, which is mine. But currently, the field as a whole would probably say both of those, that religious people tend to be more intuitive and less analytical. Those of you put the cognitive reflection test, good job. Uh, let's see, the MMPI, that's actually a test of psychopathology, a big long test. I've never taken it, but I hear it's got hundreds of items on it. The NeoPi, that's a test for the big five personality traits, the, however you say that, numeracy scale, that's like, a, it's like part of an IQ test. The cognitive reflection, that's the, you know, a bat and a ball costs this much, that's that thing. All right, so those of you put highly religious people, that's at least my argument. Other people could make other arguments, but. I've suggested that, yeah, they found that atheists tend to be higher than people who are somewhat religious, but what about people who are very religious? They haven't so much focused on that end of the spectrum, so could make a difference. Whoever put false, good job. Yeah, so in general, I found that at the high end of religiosity, it seemed like uh, analytical thinking went up. So in contrast to what most people have found. Yep, you're exactly right. That's what the majority of work seems to suggest right now. Does you put, uh, when they perceive the deceased as unfaithful, right, you are. So it seemed like when they thought, this person I'm probably not going to meet in heaven. And so they seem to struggle a lot more, as one might guess, with that kind of thing. Okay. Right. Good job. Thank you all for playing. I still find that thing really fun. I got to try this in more classes. And we do have another question too. 
Oh, yeah. Um, they said, would a person with strong faith or confidence in enlightenment ideas be considered as having high religiosity? Uh, can you elaborate a little more about like what, what kinds of things would that include? Well, that one thing it would include is a certain confidence in the use of reason and scientific method to find out the problems, and an idea that most pro that we can reduce a large number of problems to to the scientific method. Yes. And also, certain belief. Uh, I would, in enlightenment, you also have a lot of belief about new ways, new methods of social and political organization originating at that time. Yeah, I get your point. So uh, I don't think that that would be considered a dimension of religiosity, but uh, it probably wouldn't be considered counter to religiosity either. In other words, religious or non-religious people might have that view. So like, I'll use myself as an example. I, I'm a religious person and yet I, uh, I think the scientific method is really important. <laughs> and so, uh, so I think that uh, that wouldn't necessarily be regarded as a religious view, but religious or non-religious people could certainly hold those kinds of views. Right, but you could, for instance, but I, right, though I think you could have, there's a certain, I mean, pe pe people with, if you have a strong, that's why I was saying, if you have a strong faith in such ideas, for instance, religious people would also consider that their predicts, they, they have certain ideas about history that are well founded. So it depends. So a lot of the difference between religiosity and non religiosity in the conventional analysis seems to be based on whether or not they think that how well founded they think the faith is. Uh, uh. Well, that's a good question. I, uh, I think that probably most people, regardless of what their view is, I'm going to guess, most people probably regard their view as pretty well-founded. But I think that people do differ on uh, like the degree to which investigating that kind of thing is really important for them. So like there's a friend of mine who uh, thinks a lot about his faith and reasons for it and, you know, why do I hold this view and what evidence do I have and things along those lines. There's this other uh, kind of personality characteristic called the need for cognition. It's the degree to which people enjoy thinking. So like people who like crossword puzzles and, you know, solving riddles and like challenges that make them think and stuff like that. And so uh, people who are high in that quality, I think, regardless of whatever their religious view might be, whether they're, uh, you know, Hindu or Buddhist or an atheist or a Christian or whatever it might be, I think that those sorts of individuals would, they would be more interested in investigating and trying to find, you know, evidence that does the evidence support this view or that view. Thank you. Sure, yeah. It looks like that was the only other question that came through. So if anybody else wants to ask some last minute questions, you can do that. Is there anything that you wanted to add, Dr. Kroll? Uh, I can't really think of anything, but thanks for letting me, thanks for letting me do this.